adding new dimensions of artistry and creativity to piano teaching. Emphasizing analysis and creativity while building a strong technical foundation for musical expression. Hear about a unique piano teaching method that enriches the lives of piano students. Good to have you with us. I'm An Zhang Han for Heart to Heart. I had a horrible piano teacher who used to slap me on my hands every time I got a wrong note and that is why I quit at the very first opportunity I got. But had I had a teacher like my guest today, who knows, I might even be a concert pianist today. Good to have you with us. Thank you. Good to be here. So um, I was about, uh, I think, seven or eight when I first started learning how to play the piano and as I said, I had a miserable teacher. Oh, wow. <laughs> I had a miserable time. I wish uh, I knew you back then. Exactly. So, well, well, how old were you when you started? I was really the same age. Mm -hmm. I started at age eight, mm -hmm. which from today's standards, that's a little later than what many teacher or students are starting. For pianists, For anyway. pianists, yes. Mm -hmm. But uh, certainly back, you know, when I was a child, that was pretty usual. Mm. And it's not too late by any means. It worked for me, so it works for many. What was your teacher like? My teacher was very strict. Oh. Yeah. She didn't she was slap you with strict. a plastic ruler, though. She didn't slap <laughs> me with a ruler, but she made me stay after class and uh -huh. play my scales on a wooden keyboard that, where the keys didn't go down. But you still liked playing it. I did, yes. Oh. And so somehow I survived that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But the, um, I think the character of music and the quality of music the interest in playing the instrument superseded the teacher's characteristics. Right, so you like the instrument and the music I did. more than the teacher. Mm -hmm. I'd say I like the challenge, mm -hmm. but I have to admit I switched teachers after that first year <laughs> and that made a world of difference too. <laughs> so when was your debut as a pianist? I was a teenager, uh -huh. yeah, about 17, and I began to, began to win piano competitions. Mm -hmm. And uh, you've been performing Quite Ever a bit since? of performing, uh -huh. yeah, lots of performing and lots of writing. My wife uh, is a composer, mm -hmm. and she and I have been, you know, working on a lot of writing and looking at the issues of piano teaching, mm -hmm. in addition to the emphasis on, on the performing elements of piano. Mm. So let's talk about uh, piano pedagogy. Yes, you are an expert in that, and uh, you obviously didn't have too much fun when you first started learning how to play the piano. What made you decide that you wanted to actually concentrate on the pedagogical aspects of piano? That's a good question on the teaching mm. side as mm -hmm. to just the performing side. Mm. I think I've seen a lot mm. of positive elements of good teaching and negative elements of bad teaching. Enough to have become aware of that mm. in my 20s. Although I have to admit, I didn't start out with a keen interest in teaching. I began when I was about 16, and I just taught to have some extra money mm. to pay my college mm. and so forth. But when I started to see what a difference my teaching was making on the, on the student, in other words, when I really realized I could make it, was making an impact, sometimes really positive, uh -huh. but sometimes rather negative, uh -huh. then I had to reflect a bit and say, hey, this is a powerful means, you know, there's a real influence as a person I'm having here on a student, so I better take this teaching side a little more seriously. Overall, when you were teaching as a teenager, do you think you were a, a good teacher? I more times than it's not. It's a really good question. Uh -huh. Probably more times than not. Mm -hmm. I certainly reflect on a lot of things that I was doing wrong, mm -hmm. but there was a, some sense of enthusiasm and uh, maybe a resonance, you could say, with the child. Because mm -hmm. I, I did sense that I wanted that individual to be really interested in what we were doing. Mm -hmm. And so I was always looking for something that caught the interest of the student. But then you met your wife, Nancy, yes. and, and the teaching became a little more serious. It really did. Mm -hmm. We um, were teaching together and we were performing together, but we found that we weren't happy with the materials available for teaching. And so I was writing some curriculum on helping the students improvise and mm -hmm. play some pop styles and mm -hmm. my wife Nancy she's a composer so she was writing pieces for the students mm -hmm. so before you know it we had a curriculum of some new ways of presenting concepts and a set of pieces that the students were enjoying uh -huh. and from there it began to 
become a more serious mission for us to address the issues of what kind of curriculum and materials are really needed. So from the very beginning, you two shared a common interest in piano teaching. I'd say that's pretty true, mm -hmm. although, you know, many things in life you can't, you don't totally predict where it'll go. Right. But I remember when I was 16 even, looking at books like piano methods mm -hmm. on the shelves and, and really envisioning my own there. Mm -hmm. And I found out after we were married that Nancy had the same kind of thoughts. Right. So it just seemed to be once we came together, there's a natural momentum and a natural energies to make that happen. So, in the beginning, you taught piano uh, in a style of pop music. It, to some degree. See, uh -huh. I, I have a background, I'm a classical pianist right. primarily, but um, as soon as I turned 18, I had a recording contract on the pop side. Ooh. So I was always doing, you know, the, 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 I would do that sort of thing. And so I had that element. I could get around the keyboard in that way. But I would also, you know, play serious classical works also. And it was hard to find how they integrate. And I sought that a lot when I was in middle school. And I would be studying Bach 17th century counterpoint styles, but then listening to Led Zeppelin. Right, you know, you right. can see how they don't always merge. You know, reading those college texts on box theory didn't fit with pop music, so I had to sort out a lot of those issues during so my Nancy teens. Nancy probably helped out a lot too then because she is a composer and she writes original music, so she was probably able to bridge. To bridge that in many ways, I think mm -hmm. so. Because eventually for me the tech, this theory came together and I was able to get some merger. And Nancy as a composer, she had even more Mm -hmm. uh, creativity, I think. Mm -hmm. you know, I had patterns and she had creativity and we started to merge those and then we, we found some really good synergy, I guess is right. the best word for it. And the fruit of your collaboration resulted in a series of books called Piano Adventures. Thank you. Thank yes. You. Uh -huh. How are they different from existing materials? Well, I think I'd summarize it both that they're very student centered. Mm -hmm. Student, as when you were describing your piano lessons, it seemed it was either teacher centered or the music centered. And especially if we're looking at music that's um, you know, 150 years old, uh, sometimes that doesn't resonate with the child. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And both Nancy and I are very much into classical music, and mm -hmm. this is where we're, we direct the students. But we understand that the student won't, really won't have interest unless we can catch them from where their heart is and where their interest in the sounds that they want to play. Mm -hmm. And students differ. So by being more student-centered, we're able to capture their spark and sparkle and bring that to the lesson. These books are geared towards what, children then? Children who are yes. starting out? We have, really we have um, multiple versions. We have a basic course, Piano Adventures for 8 to 12, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and we have an accelerated Piano Adventures for the older beginner and adult mm -hmm. course as well. And then our new course is the My First Piano Adventures for the Very Young. Right. Let's talk about the advantages of learning to play the piano. Apparently, mm -hmm. it helps develop the child's character um, and makes the child a better uh, person, I guess, a, a, a better child. A better, <laughs> well, yeah, I think a good word for that yeah. is, is the personal development. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And I divide it into kind of two modes of thinking there. The, I put a lot of time in thinking, what are the cognitive or the mental benefits, mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. such as increasing an individual's confidence. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the student may learn different ways of learning, uh, different learning strategies in the discipline of repetition and focus. Um, even the concept of some research now in left and right brain integration, mm -hmm. music being very much a right brain activity, but if we're learning music, we have to be analytical about it. We reflect on and analyze and so we get a merger, a cross-talk, if you will, between the brain hemispheres. Wow, there's a lot more science to piano teaching. Well, there? I think there is. Uh -huh. And that, I actually find that very fascinating. It's a merger of psychology, you might mm -hmm. say, and piano performance, mm -hmm. if we really want to be a fine teacher. So you established Faber Piano Institute, um, and you employed a, a, a bunch of new teaching methods for um, piano education. What, what, what are they? Can you give us some examples? Yes, we um, have been finding, after we wrote the method, we really wanted to research the 
implementation. Mm -hmm. In other words, how does a teacher actually work with a student to optimize the lesson? Because it's one thing to have the books and curriculum, which is critical, mm -hmm. but once we have that, what are the interactions between the student and teacher that really make a big difference? And mm -hmm. as in your case, it wasn't really the resonance of, uh, that excited you about <laughs> piano, to put it mildly. <laughs> Pretty one-sided. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> and so we've been researching that a lot now. Mm -hmm. Are those, those communication tools and a sense of um, interest from the teacher and the child, how much the child needs to talk with the teacher, not just one way, and uh, so getting that sense of dialogue and that interaction inspires the motivation mm -hmm. to make things happen. I mean, it's only natural for a child to be interested in something um, only when he or she is motivated or, or when yes. she's enjoying herself. Right? Oh, that's so true. Mm -hmm. And you can see how that would be uh, run into a problem sometime with typical piano lessons mm -hmm. because if it's imposed by the parent or it's imposed by the teacher, the student just goes to the motions. Mm. I even remember a, a story when I was uh, young. I was sitting at the Steinway piano with my teacher and she had another Steinway here mm -hmm. and I'm playing charity exercises. Right. Right? I had absolutely no interest in this and I didn't practice them at all, but she didn't know that. And I look out the window over here and my friend is doing a chin-up on the ledge outside, <laughs> peeking in, saying, like this, he's showing me this play. football, uh -huh. come out and play. And my mind is totally on my friend. I'm just going through some motions, not even hearing what my teacher is saying. Right. And that kind of illustrates, I think, even if the individual pays some attention, if the, the emotions aren't open for learning, really, mm -hmm. if the child doesn't want to be there from uh, some part of inside the individual. So I understand you emphasize three things in uh, the piano lessons, um, analysis, creativity, and expression. And if you put the initials together, you get ace. I like that. Thank <laughs> you for bringing that up. We're kind of proud of that one. That was our first, one of the first instructional theories we came up with at the Institute, because it's a way of making a more diverse approach to the lesson mm -hmm, mm -hmm. by having analysis, creativity, and expression, we get more aspects of the person mm -hmm. becoming involved. In other words, typically piano lessons are learning pieces. And if we're just learning another piece and learning a piece, it becomes very sequential and regimented. But if we really look at it, we want to analyze the piece. We want to find the patterns and understand the patterns of the pieces in a more deep way. Mm. See, then we have a lot more value. We're playing, for instance, a pocketball canon. And mm -hmm. Well, if, if a student just reads notes, mm. I, mean, I heard a duet recently, two people were playing it, a father and a daughter, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and it was very complex. And if they miss one note, then everything falls apart. But if we look at it, it's just going down a fourth, then up a step, and down a fourth, then up a step, down a fourth. Aww. See, then the four and the five. So we build chords on those. So I can make up anything I want here. Instead of just playing the notes right at, right at the exact moment, it, it sounds more like music. It does. <laughs> And it's coming from the heart. Right. And it, in, in other words, what we're doing with that analysis is trying to make the complexity of the score very simple. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. once we find the simplicity, mm. then we can be so much more expressive with it. Mm -hmm. And then that's the other part of ACE, isn't it? We have the analysis and the expression. So having the student connect with the music enough so they have something to say. How do you teach stuff like that to kids who are only four, five, six years old, though? Well, that's a good question. But uh. sometimes the youngsters have it even more instinctively than the older students. Really? There aren't the same expectations of what the lessons are going to be about. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, a youngster is, has a lot of energy. And as long as we don't go in there with saying, do this, now do this, now do this, then we can have a spirit of play. Right. Because piano adventures, I believe, work exceptionally well with young children. It does. We've had so much fun with my first piano adventures course, which is the right. newly released. Right. Uh, uh, the new released uh, course for ages five and six. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that just really incorporates that learning through play. So it's playful activities. And you can see how that ties in with creativity, too. The individual is just sparks, and they can have input, and 
they get excited about the sounds and it's, uh, it's just been a lot of fun. Apparently, depending on how you touch the keyboard, you can produce a completely different sound? It's true. Is it true? Yeah, they said often, you know, if students go through the motions, if they're not trained well, they just think it's all finger work. Mm. And you get um, one touch. <laughs> And then you yes. get one sound, exactly. right? Exactly. One touch, uh -huh. one sound. But that doesn't give us the color we're after uh -huh. as a musician, as a real artist. We want, we want to play with colors. So how do you touch it then? I do, I work with the three-dimensional space over the keyboard. In other words, not just being on top of the keyboard in this way, but I'll do the gestures so that I'm dealing with the space above the keys. You see the oh. difference? Oh. And maybe instead of just playing the key with that curved finger, I may approach it with a flat finger moving into the curve, which gives me much more time on the key. You see? Oh, I see. You see, my finger's pretty flat there, but then it rolls into the curve. It's and not just this. the fingers moving, you're actually moving your hands, your yes. wrists. And Your really arms. the arms, the whole body is involved. There's a heaviness to the arms, uh -huh. and I really like to utilize that heaviness. We do quite a lot with the students at their early lessons to feel the weight of the arm, because really what we can do, when you have big pieces, uh -huh. uh, there's just um, there's just so many notes to yeah. cover that if we just use finger muscles, we'd be fatigued with the first 20 notes. Mm. But if you drop with the arm weight, you get lots of efficiencies. Uh -huh. So it's, it's tossing and rolling and dropping and thrusting, and that gives efficiencies to the finger motions and takes the burden off the fingers. Oh, so you're moving the fingers much less than you normally Yes, do. that's really you're true. You're moving your whole body yes. instead. You know, so you can see sometimes pianists do this, they're lifting their fingers. And they think, well, if I lift high, then I can come down harder, and right, maybe yeah. I can build lots of muscle, uh -huh, right? Uh -huh. But piano playing really isn't about building muscle. It's about building coordination. So if I use arm weight, uh -huh. I can just twitch. And that, see how that would, I put a little arm weight behind this. All I have to do is wiggle the finger very little, and I get lots of sound. <laughs> But my fingers aren't fatigued at all because they're really just doing this. Mm -hmm. And it sounds much better too. It does. It right. sounds and you get more evenness, you get more control and really a bigger palette uh -huh. of, of colors. Then what do you do for um, students of intermediate or above levels? Um, right. That, this at that point they really have to work on expressing themselves but at the same time building their, building up their technical skills. Right. And there's always the issue of how to do that efficiently, mm -hmm. and also how to do it without building bad habits in the process. That's one of the things I've been very interested in is in developing really good technique with students mm -hmm. because the technique facilitates the expression, but also good technique means we're not going to wear out the body or we're going to be doing playing habits that build tension. Mm -hmm. And sometimes when students just practice, they may practice four hours a day but if they play a piece and they go through muscling down, you see all the muscle work. They think, well, I'm what practicing. I used to do. <laughs> right. But you may be, then instead of building coordination, you may be building tension. Oh. So for something like that, to play it properly, I just thrust here and maybe here, a toss to this note. You see, you get the toss, the da 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 See how that gives that efficiency. And that makes it easy to play and the fingers aren't fatigued. Come to think of it, my tyranny exercises never sounded like music. It just sounded uh, like a broken record. I think record. that's true, yes. Uh -huh. yeah. But playing it that way, you can actually make something like a tyranny exercise You can make it like sound beautiful. Sound like music. That's definitely uh -huh. true. Oh. Yeah. Beautiful. I, mm -hmm. Go ahead. Beautiful, though, is a very um, subjective thing. <laughs> That's a very good point. Yeah. It is, isn't it? Uh, Just like the styles of music and mm -hmm. the interest is subjective and different. Mm. What's beautiful to one may not be interesting to the other. Mm. So how do you make sure? And, and, it, and it depends on the piece you're playing as well. 
So how do you ensure with every uh, student, every performer, every instrument, every piece, you're producing the most beautiful sound possible? Oh, that's a really good, a really good question. I had a teacher in college who was really helpful that way for me mm -hmm. because being playing popular music and classical, I had a tendency sometimes just to go to the piano and you, you know uh -huh. touch it and play it in a way that Correct. wasn't. It didn't have intention. And so it's great to have a student know that every time they play a note, you know, it has some meaning. And I like to connect the ear mm -hmm. to the technique. So issues of touch and gesture isn't just for the sake of playing the notes and really not even for just the efficiency, but it's because it creates a different sound. So when we can really open the student's ear, then they can paint with a palette of sounds. So we have something. So now we listen. You hear the resonate, mm. resonating sound, so I paint against that. Mm. personal choice. How did I want to shape it? How loud did I want to make mm -hmm. it when I pull back? And other pianists might go forward and go louder. That's the expression side of our analysis, creativity, and expression model. That's pretty. Thank you. Uh, you should really go around the world, meet every single piano teacher there is, that tell them <laughs> to change their ways. <laughs> Thank you. We'd have a lot more musicians in this world. The world would be a more beautiful place. Well, we've been having a lot of fun, fun with that. Nancy and I, you know, both and oh, it's been a great time here in Korea. Mm. We just had a marvelous time this weekend. First with our clinician session on Friday, we had 250 Piano Adventures clinicians that mm. were especially invited for that session where we talked about the intimacy between teacher and student. Mm. What are good teaching habits? What are bad teaching habits? Um, and then the full Saturday, we looked at issues of touch to sound, and my first Piano Adventures, and ended with a recital and we just had a great time, a lot of oh, rollicking mm -hmm. enthusiasm mm -hmm. really. And it, so it's just been splendid. I just uh, love being here in Seoul. So you spend quite a lot of time traveling around the world giving lessons on piano lessons. Yeah, right? that's really what it is. It's mm -hmm. a good point. Um, what about plans as a concert pianist? Do you continue that as well? I do. What I've been doing more and more also is instead of just talking with the teachers about our mm -hmm. materials, I like to give a recital in the community mm -hmm. while I'm if I, while I'm in the city or in the country, and then sometimes those are just piano teachers, but often we open them up to the general public and the kids. Mm -hmm. And I just love that, having the wide variety in the audience. You see four, five, six-year-olds, teenagers, the piano teachers, the students' parents, and uh, that's, that's, that's a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. On my script here, it says your dream is to start a music program at uh, Chinese orphanages. Oh, yes, is indeed. Is that right? It is. See, our daughter is uh, adopted from China. Oh. Yeah, we adopted Vivian uh, from the People's Republic of China when oh. she was 14 months mm -hmm. old. And she's really becoming quite a musician. But uh, we just understand the orphanage situations. And in the United States and around the world, piano lessons are often available to those who have money. So it's the question of those that don't have the resources often don't get to have the, that opportunity. So. Mm. We did start the Faber Foundation for Music Education and the Arts, and we certainly need more fundraising on it, but we've endowed it to get it going. And uh, the goal is to try to make piano more available to those who couldn't afford it. Mm -hmm. And our own personal project on that is to try to bring a set of piano teachers into orphanages and give those children some special opportunities to connect with music. Well, I hope uh, that uh, dream will come true because, after all, with music, the world can become a more beautiful place, couldn't it? Thank you so much. Well, That's really well put. Thank you very much, Mr. Faber, for uh, sharing your expertise with us today, and I do hope you enjoy the rest of your stay here in Korea. Thank you so much. It's been my pleasure. We all know that uh, when we enjoy the learning process, we enjoy what we learn as well. And uh, the same goes for piano lessons. Why not find something in your life uh, that is fun to learn and start taking it up? That is it for this edition of Heart to Heart. I'll be back with more next time.